My name is Martina Kreger, called Tina. I uh, live in Glen Allen, Virginia. My experiences as a young child, really, were uh, the only experiences I really had at, for instance, Monticello. Uh, it was something that my family never really sat down and talked to me about, but it was a lot of fun because there was nobody who told us what we could look at, no one who told us where we could or could not go, and it was just a, a great, great fun time for a bunch of kids. I did not go much after that, uh, after my parents you know, divorced finally. Um, I became a teenager. My mother was not interested particularly in carrying on that tradition. She wasn't the relative, so did not go for a number of years. Um, my daughter was born, and it just never fit. It just, it was, you know, it was one weekend a year. I always got the information. I paid my dues. I, I you know, stayed in touch that way, but um, there was never time. There was not an opportunity to take a whole weekend. Uh, there was a softball tournament or, you know, a project due, and it just didn't fit. And uh, as far as knowing that it was, you know, I was a relative to Thomas Jefferson, it was just okay, <laughs> you know, okay. Um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't sitting at my table for Christmas dinner or anything like that. Uh, but it was still kind of interesting, but it wasn't something that I, I really talked about because it wasn't really appropriate. There, was, there were not the occasions to just sort of whip this fact out. I had a couple of experiences. It's interesting, as a child, I went to Catholic school, and when we were studying Virginia history, I mentioned that I was descended from Thomas Jefferson. And of course, this was a nun, and she did not believe me. And uh, the note went home, and I took in one of my letters uh, that was my mother had on the wall, and uh, was able to prove it that way. I'm not sure she still really believed me, but. And then another event, it was, it's interesting how this has sort of played out again. When my daughter went to Monticello, and she was probably 11, and she was not well, really outspoken, she was kind of quiet, and they were taking the tour, through the house and uh, talking about a bunch of different stuff and evidently the, the, the tour guide at the end asked if anyone had anything to say and my my daughter decided she would speak up and she mentioned well, I'm related to Thomas Jefferson and this lady looked at her and she said honey he has lots of relatives shut her down <laughs> so sure I'm going to talk about it but it's it I don't introduce myself as um, let me tell you my lineage um, th this is how I got to be who I am uh, it's it's just not it's not important to me in that in that way it, it, it does not it's not who I am it really I don't think has made me any kind of person at all because it's just not to me it's just not a big deal again I didn't I didn't go get it. it. It's just happened. It was just there. I was born into it, and it, it's just there. Uh, same thing with my daughter. I don't think it will be important, particularly to her. Uh, it's cool to know it. I mean, it's nice to have that that lineage, but it's not anything that I've got to to advertise, and I don't think she will either. I don't think that's part of her makeup or her personality either to 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 work that into conversation very often. So. I enjoy the the heritage, I guess. I mean, it's it's nice. I I didn't buy it. I didn't earn it. Uh, it's just there. It's it's not something I wear. It's not something I really speak about. Um, but it is interesting. After we moved out of the city and moved into a house with windows locked. My father would start showing up, he lived in Baltimore, and he'd start showing up with stuff that he hadn't given me before because we didn't live in what my mother deemed a safe area. So, But he started showing up with the clocks and the books and things of that nature. And he walked in one day with a little square box and he opened the box and, and there was this chamois cloth and he took the chamois apart and out came this dumbbell. And he handed it to me and he said, you might wanna hang on to this. That's what he said, that's what I knew. And it was engraved on the on the you know, on the end of the dumbbell, you know, Thomas Jefferson. And I kept it on a box in front of my fireplace for a while until it was it was it was sort of like, why do I have this? Uh, I don't need it. Um, 
So I sent them the, the dumbbell, and it has it's in a picture on a magazine, and she sent me the copy of the magazine, and that's kind of interesting. And I again just it's on permanent loan. Uh, I just signed the loan papers every year. There's a dumb waiter up there that was my father's that he I guess signed away years and years ago, um, and he just he essentially just gave it to Monticello, and that's probably what I'll do with the dumbbell because again what my daughter would do with it. I have no idea. Uh, it's interesting to have, but it's better being part of its history, you know, being in its proper place, which is where it was used. So um, I'm, I'm happy with it staying there. As my father, my father no more knew what to do with a kid than he knew how to fly to the moon. Uh, because again, he was not, he was not a hands-on person. He was uh, very, very much a, a loner. Uh, he was as a lot of extremely intelligent people are, he was very socially awkward. He was taken out of school when he was, I think, in seventh or eighth grade because they couldn't do anything for him. He was off the charts. I remember very few conversations with him until I was a, a teenager because he couldn't communicate with a child. He, he just couldn't. Uh, that was left to my mother. Uh, was to take care of me and to to deal with me and to, to do all the kid details. He did cool things. He he built me a huge sandbox. He he built the tractor that I mentioned earlier. He he built a car that I used a pedal car. I mean he built these things, uh, and I enjoyed them. They were fun, uh, and that's how he that's how he related because to sit down and talk or to help me with homework, um, he couldn't do it of, of the way he was. Uh, he was interested. He was interested in Adrian. I was glad he was more comfortable with my daughter than he ever really was with me, which was good. She also had more of his gift for the the mechanical, and she saw it better than I did. And she always enjoyed him. She was comfortable with him and made him comfortable with her. Uh, she liked him. She she enjoyed her her visits with her grandfather. He always brought her interesting, cool stuff, uh, but she did enjoy it. And, um, you know, again, as far as the, the, the Jefferson tie-in, you know, who really knows? Uh, you know, I think it was probably present in him, uh, but whether or not, you know, it goes any farther, you know, I just don't know. Time will tell. So we're here today in Jackson Ward, which is in fact where my ancestors and my family used to hang out a hundred years ago. And it was probably kind of like it is today because it's very festive today. There's, uh, um, I think uh, they call it the Second Street or Two Street Festival. And, um, and there's just lots of activity. And 100 years ago, Jackson Ward was very commercial. It was called the Harlem of the South. And so you would have seen people walking around. There would have been people walking behind me, just as there were today, waving, speaking, knowing each other. So being here today is kind of like it was when my relatives were here 100 years ago. And that's, that's pretty cool. I'm Gail Jessup White. I moved here, oh, 10 years ago now, so my son could go to high school here and my husband could teach at um, university not far. And in the process of coming to Richmond, Virginia, a place I never thought I'd call home, I found my roots. My, my history goes back to, um, oh, the mid-19th century, to um, Shadwell, which was Thomas Jefferson's childhood home, back to Monticello itself. Um, and then um, to Goochland, eventually from Charlottesville, where Monticello is, to Goochland, and then to here. So Richmond is now home, really home for me. So a little bit about my family. My grandmother's name was Eva Robinson Taylor. She was my father's mother. She was born in Charlottesville, Virginia in 1883. She had two names, one Robinson for her black family, one Taylor for her white family. The Taylors were related to Thomas Jefferson and the Randolph clan. So that's how I came to be descended from Thomas Jefferson. The Robinsons, however, are descended from Sally Hemings' family. Sally Hemings' um, brother, one of her older brothers, Peter. Peter was my great, great, great grandfather. 
And that's really the background of my ties to the Hemings family. Peter Hemings was my great, great, great grandfather. Peter Hemings was Sally Hemings' older brother. Now, a little bit about Peter Hemings. Peter Hemings was the child of a relationship between John Wales and an enslaved person named Elizabeth. John Wales was the father-in-law of Thomas Jefferson. So these ties go way back and way deep into Virginia's history. Peter Hemings, of course, became um, um, the property, it's awkward to say, but he became the property of Thomas Jefferson when his father-in-law, John Wales, died. Um, and so he became the property of uh, Thomas Jefferson and his wife, Martha. Peter Hemings was described uh, by Thomas Jefferson as highly intelligent, as were all the Hemingses. They were very bright people. And when you visit Monticello, and I encourage everybody to do so, um, you can learn about um, Peter Hemings and the entire Hemings family. We have um, a Hemings family tour that will tell you about not just the Hemings family, but how the enslaved community lived. What I like to describe to people when I talk about the work I do in Monticello, and I didn't mention that, um, I am community engagement um, officer at Monticello. And when I talk about the work I do, my focus is on the enslaved community and the realness of the, the people who lived in Monticello. 150 people were enslaved in Monticello at any given time. Once the enslaved finished their daily duties, which were generally from sunrise to sunset, they went to their own homes, cabins, which were in fact their homes. It's where they lived, it's where they raised their children, it's where they served their meals, it's where they taught their children lessons, it's where they became ill and at some point died. These were real people, and that's what I like to emphasize with our guests at Monticello, that in fact, these were not just a, a, a brown, black, tan monolith moving through history without names. These are people who had desires and wishes in spite of their circumstances uh, of enslavement. They wanted for things, and they wanted to live, and they wanted better lives for their children. And when emancipation came, um, many of those people who had been enslaved, many of my family members, in fact, did reach the greatest heights they could, beginning with um, Andrew's father, Anderson, who was my great-grandmother's brother. Um, they had a, fa a farm. They moved from Charlottesville to a farm, hundreds of acres in Goochland, and then eventually to Richmond, and then to Washington, D.C., where my grandmother moved, and then to Philadelphia, where other of her cousins moved, and then to New York. And now we have Robinsons in California, and no doubt Robinsons all over the world. And Robinsons, um, after that um, second generation out of slavery, became doctors, lawyers, educators. Um, um, in my family, there are a lot of um, uh, federal workers. Those were great jobs in Washington, federal government. Um, journalists, writers, artists, there are many artists in my family. My own son is an engineer. We just, there's this progression. Um, the American dream um, can be seen in the people of my family. And so it's an honor for me to talk about the Robinsons and how much they accomplished and, um, and the roots that we have and that I have in Richmond and in Virginia. I'm proud of that. I'm Kathleen. I'm Charles of Charles Marx. And we are the Marxists. We live in Midlothian, Virginia, just over the city line. And we've been married over 40 years. 40 years? Yeah. Edward Cooper worked at the Tredegar and lived in town. But somehow he met Emma Amelia Frank, and they were married in Emmanuel Episcopal Church at Brook Hill in 1889. 
I think an interesting side of their courtship is their texting for 1880s. My grandmother would listen for Edward's horse to jump North Run. She knew he was coming. After their evening together or whatever, picnic in the middle of the day or whatever, he would leave and she would listen for his horse again to jump North Run and she knew he had left the property and was on his way home. So things were going along very, very well until 1908. In June of 1908, my grandmother's mother died, Anna Christina. Less than three weeks later, John Butler Cooper died of typhoid fever, which of course was dreaded because there was nothing you could do. And the next June, her father died. So in 11 months, she lost both of her parents and one of her children. She was left devastated. So my grandmother, in her grief, would walk from Winder Street to Riverview Cemetery to grieve over John's grave. And of course, my grandfather was going to work and he worried about this, so he had a bench cast at the Tredegar for her to sit on when she went to the grave. Now, I remember this bench. It was still there when I was a child. And later, my mother was warned that cast iron benches were being stolen right and left from Riverview. So then it was removed and it's now at the Valentine. That was the reason my mother donated it. So what do you do with a grieving mother? You build a new house and you have another baby. So John died in August of 1908. They contracted with Lewis Ginner, who was developing Ginner Park to build a house in Ginner Park. The house was late, my mother was early. My mother was born October the 21st of 1909. They moved into the new house on December the 13th of that year, my mother just a few weeks old. And she told the story as if she remembered every bit of it, that she and her older brothers and sisters were in the hack with their mother and the fruitcake. The fruitcake came in the hack to the new house. So they started a new life. My grandmother was 43 years old as a new mother with a new baby and a son who was a sophomore at VPI. Of course, now Virginia Tech. But going back to my mother as a little girl, um, there is a picture of her taken on the front porch when she was three years old with her older sister, Emma, Emma Irene, whom I called Emmy. They were two powerful women in my life. Anyway, th things were going quite well, and then when my mother was five, my grandfather had a stroke, which left him able to walk, but it, he had expressive aphasia. He could not call things by their right name, and he lived 13 years. This was very, very difficult for my grandmother because she had no pension, no social security, she had no income. Supposedly, a man came through many springs and bought lilacs off of her lilac bush and took them to New York. That was a source of income. I think she sold peonies to people. She baked bread. A Victorian lady would certainly not go out of the house to earn a living. So, there were some difficult financial times at that point, but the mortgage was paid, the house was kept, and in 1928, my grandfather died. So you had my grandmother as the matriarch and two of her only two daughters and their husbands living in all in the same house. Emma was widowed when her only child was about 12 years old. Uncle Frank was widowed about the same time, and his only child and Emma's only child were only six weeks apart in age. So the widowed children came home, and Frank's son, Cullen, and Emma's son, Lester, were raised more or less as brothers. So we get through the Depression, and we get to World War II. Well, my father says, to my mother, Uncle Sam doesn't want me. I'm 35 years old. I'm too old. The, the boys, as they were called, Lester and Cullen, were in high school. They graduated from high school, and boy, Uncle Sam wanted them. 
Helen chose the Air Corps, Lester chose the Marines, and my father called my mother one day and said greetings. That's all she needed to hear and she knew. They left the house within eight days time. My mother said the roast the next Sunday lasted for days. There were three women there, my grandmother, my widowed aunt, Emma, and my mother worrying about the war, which really became real to me when as a mother, my younger daughter went to Iraq in 2007 during the surge as a young naval officer. She was on the ground. They were taking naval officers and embedding them in um, army units. I could email her anytime I wanted. She emailed me. We talked to her once a week. I can't imagine what those three women did to try to deal with what they, they were going through. Their biggest thing was the yard. My grandmother had quite a green thumb. Her two daughters followed right behind her. And my mother said they watered that ground with tears all during the rest of the war. I was born in July of 1947 and grew up at my grandparents' house. My grandmother was still living and died when I, just before my fifth birthday. I have very, very little recollection of her. Uh, I do remember the day she died. So that was 1952 and sort of a new chapter began. That's when I became conscious of Riverview Cemetery. My mother and, and Emma wanted to go to the cemetery to tend the grave, which we did, and paint the bench. So I began going, I remember taking picnic lunches and sitting on the ground, and I remember the red clay and that type of thing. They were very, very concerned that the graves, where they both would be buried, would grow up into weeds. So in 1954, they put the plot into perpetual care. My mother and aunt discussed the large sum of money. The Riverview people think it was about $180, which in 1954 was a fair amount of money. Also in 1954, my father had a heart attack and was subsequently diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. It affected his speech very, very badly. So he could no longer teach. And that began, my father was taken sick when I was seven and died when I was 20. So you have two generations of 13 years of illness. I went off to college, to Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, and my freshman year, Aunt Emma had a devastating stroke. It was spring of my freshman year. She lived six months. She died just before I went back for my sophomore year. Then my father died between Bastille Day between my junior and senior years. That left my mother alone in that big house. I was going back for my senior year in college and mother was alone. The decision came to sell the house. She did not want to be in that big house alone. The big things I remember are the strong women. I come from a long line of women who lost their husbands and had to carry on in the rearing of children. They were determined. They were going to see that their children were educated and the big thing was sacrifice. But the strength of those women, Emma, my mother, and my grandmother drew a lot of strength from the earth. And some people say that we play in dirt. It was a source of income. And um, it was surely an antidepressant. But it is a solace. I'm Wilbur Jr. I'm Michael. I'm Linda. And I'm Debbie. And we're the Jacksons. So we all went to school here in Richmond. They went far earlier than I did. She's trying to say that she's the baby. <laughs> <laughs> but we all did, the, the common experience for the four of us is that we all went to Albert D. Narrow, every, every, all four of us for elementary school. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful because yes. you walk two blocks from 2502 North Avenue around the corner and you were at school and it didn't matter rain or shine. Uh, you always walked to school and uh, never had a problem. 
you had your galoshes and your rain slickers and all of that. And so it was a very positive experience, not just being at school, but just the transition going back and forth between home and school and with your friends. So you're always together with friends and always walking. So we grew up here in Northside and we went to sixth grade downtown in a neighborhood where the kids didn't like us. Mm -hmm. And so every day we got either beat up or chased home every day. And so, you know, it was kind of intimidating and kind of a challenge to be in that environment, but we still got a good education. The, the segregated borderline, so to speak, was Brooklyn Park Boulevard. And you had African-American people on one side, white folks on the other side. And when we crossed over is when we would get harassed. And we were, things were said to us like, go back to your side of the boulevard and go back to Africa and all kinds of um, harassment. Um, but we kept walking and we just would go on to school because our parents had prepared us for that. You know, the parents in our neighborhood had really spoken with us and talked to us to help us to understand what we might encounter. Now, we had, um, I think I had mentioned a, a girlfriend of mine whose father, a grandfather worked at the cleaners on Brooklyn Park Boulevard. So he was always there and always watching to make sure we got that far, no problems, and then to get to school, it wasn't much further. So we didn't have, um, you know, a lot of issues in terms of once we got to school and started, you know, interacting with our classmates. But getting to school was frequently problematic. Uh, we had kids who rode the bus from another area of town to Chandler who threw things at us off the bus. You know, it was, uh, and, you know, cursed us. And sometimes we cursed back. But you no. know that mm, right. <laughs> we learned. We didn't we have learned. that going on you in know. our house. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it was really um, when you think back on it, you say, "Wow, you know that happened to me." But you didn't think much about it when you were encountering it because you just kept on walking. You know, I got to go to school. I got to get there. So it wasn't really that. Um, you know, it just we just dealt with it. Um, we had some interesting experiences when we left Jeb Stewart and went to Chandler. Um, and we encountered quite a bit of racism, don't get me wrong. And particularly stands out in my mind during this time frame where people are um, having all these issues with the um, football player that's, that's, not, that, that's kneeling during the, um, the an national anthem. When we went to John Marshall at our pep rallies, they played Dixie. So it was like, you know, I, I wish I was in Atlanta Cotton. Oh, come on down. So at that particular junction, the black kids there refused to stand. And the kids would stand for Dixie like it was the anthem of the South. And they'd stand and clap and, <laughs> you know, holler and carry on. And the black kids were like, no, we don't want to be in Atlanta Cotton. No. And we refused to stand. And as a result of the students refusing to stand, they stopped playing it. So, you know, um, we didn't, you know, we, we hadn't been trained to be um, militant. militant or <laughs> revolutionary, you know. It was just that we were offended and standing up for our rights. So that's something that we actually experienced um, past the time where the first African-American girls went to Chandler who came from Michael's class, but there were just two. And they really went to school in the midst of police protection. It was just that bad. And that was during the times, and you know, you hear this all the time, where children listened to the adults in the community. It didn't have to be your parents. Because you knew that if you acted up, by the time you got home, your parents would know and you'd be in for some punishment. And the, the neighborhood also was very good at celebrating our successes. Uh, we had a corner drugstore. Um, Dr. Harrington was the, Harrington is that his name? Yes. He Pharmacy. was the pharmacist there. 
And what they did at that drugstore is the last day of school, you could go in with your report card. And if you had straight A's, you got a cherry or vanilla Coke. Hmm. So everybody was like hanging out at the drugstore so they could get that cherry or vanilla Coke. We never got it any other time. Was, you know, we just didn't get stuff like yeah, that. You Except to pay for seven, love. seven cents for it. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah and they, they were free. I remember they burned, uh, the Ku Klux Klan burned a cross in our neighborhood. And we had neighbors who were very involved in the civil rights movement. And the Klan didn't appreciate that. So uh, that was something that kind of, I hate to use the term, was burned in my, my memory to mm -hmm. see that uh, happen right around the corner from, from where I live. I used to add a footnote to his memory when he commented on the cross burning. That was a home of Oliver Hill. The courthouse in Richmond is named in his, uh, in his memory. I'm Tracy and I'm Michelle. This is Camila. And we live in the fan in Richmond, Virginia. We we wanted to have children. Um, and it was quite a path to getting there. We we tried for um six years off and on, various um starts and stops and um tried uh adoption, an open adoption process and I really, really have always dreamed of being a mother and wanted that dream to come true in life. And so we also continued with artificial reproductive technologies. We went through a period of both wanting the same thing, both wanting a child and not wanting a child. And then we went through a period of us wanting different things. Mm -hmm. And then the period of going through that process of us both wanting the same thing yeah. again, um, I think strengthened our marriage. Um, <laughs> And I also just so. made her like all the more just, you know. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's you. So anyway, so once we got on the same page again that we wanted to have children. <laughs> that took a long time. But Yeah. Yeah. So then um we decided that um again I would try to get pregnant and um and we We knew we wanted a known donor. Yeah, that was really important to us. So um, yeah. we started thinking about um, all the men in our lives and, um, and, and who we thought would be a good match for this idea of an extended family as well. Right. Um, and it's a tricky conversation to have because, Very you know, tricky. you know, you don't like we, we want to like the, the Camilla is ours and, you know, we are we have all rights and responsibilities. Um, and so if you want to, you know, ask somebody for this thing and tell them you want them to be as involved as they'd like or no obligation. Um, and that was sort of how we entered those conversations. Um, but knowing kind of where to, you don't know what that other person cares about. And so knowing yeah. what to say. It's extremely awkward conversation. Like the the worst. I remember, I, I know I wrote this down to her, but I remember walk, our walk to go have breakfast with, with our helper daddies and um, <laughs> just being like, I can't believe we're going to sit down in, in a restaurant and like have this conversation. And I had these out of body moments of like watching us have this conversation <laughs> in this diner, you know, like wondering like, does the waitress <laughs> overhear what we're talking about? Do the other well, patrons then, yeah. hear And then it's, it's sort of like a, like a scene out of like, bubbles? you know, yeah. any sitcom. Are you playing bubbles? <laughs> yeah. And it could have been a scene taken out of like any sitcom in Brooklyn, right, Michelle? Like yeah. two lesbians, two you know gay men sitting in a diner in Park Slope talking about having a baby. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that conversation went really well, and for us, it was a sign that okay, we could, we these are our dear friends that we could we could have a we could do this with them because while it was awkward to start the conversation, it wasn't awkward once we started once we had the conversation, and then what happened? <laughs> um, no, they told us that they wanted to talk about it more, um, but they didn't run screaming. So we knew it was like, you know, we would still be friends after this conversation, even if they said no. Right. And then they called us and said they were interested in, could we meet again to talk some more? And then we started the process at home. Um, and just, I mean, put it out there, right? Like you come and make yeah. deposits at home and you try in at home insemination and um, and that you know wasn't working because it's you know hard to do to get pregnant when just in general and um, and 
So we also started working with a, a sperm bank and a fertility doctor, and that was uh, a process in and of itself. And just our, so our donor would would have to go and you know make deposits, and those would have to be tested and you know quarantine. And um, and then once and then meanwhile Michelle was getting all the blood work done and um, preparing, and um, I think several months in we were ready to start trying officially with our doctor. Well, actually, I had a surgery. Oh goodness! Yeah. I, I can't believe I, to I totally room, so. I totally blocked that out, babe. I'm so sorry. You no, did, okay. you had a surgery to make room for her. I know. I did know. you know that? Yeah. Did you know that? Um, yes, I had, I had a uterine surgery, and then there was genetic counseling we had to do, and I mean, it just like went on and on. There was actually like um, psychological counseling we had to attend to make sure we were ready to begin the IVF process. So it's not as accessible as people think right off the bat. Um, but we just kept plugging away at it, and uh, in 2015, um, we both turned 40, and we had this big 40th birthday oh, yeah. party. And it was your last. It was your second round, right? Yeah, and this was going to be my last round because I, I had turned 40, and then I was no longer eligible for our fertility benefits under insurance. And so, um, but sidebar though, like I think we skipped over just this. Like leading all up to that, like every time, every cycle, whether it was an IUI cycle or the IVF cycle, you or you know, home, or at home, like you you know, you do this thing, and it's just like your weight, like those is it ten, fourteen days, ten days, are like the longest ten or fourteen days you can you know think of, and you're just like waiting, and you're just like, well, maybe I can take the pregnancy test earlier, like you know, now they have these early ones, like maybe that'll be right, or maybe those, and you're just like. <laughs> Well, maybe, and then it's not positive, and then and then you think, oh well, it's too early, and so it's just like this. It is a it is an emotional roller coaster, and so I do remember us going through phases where we had to take turns being hopeful. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. So we turned forty. We had this big fortieth birthday party for ourselves, and then, um, but I but I just done a round of IVF, so I knew it was possible that that I could be pregnant. So. Um, that it was, was a, really probably, taking it easy. Um, we had like forty of our closest friends join us on a beach for a weekend in Texas, and um, you know it was like a lot of celebration. And you you totally prioritized the possibility of this one. Yeah, but it was it was great. So then we got back, and I went in for my blood my blood work, and I was pregnant. But I remember even during that first trimester thinking like. Again, it's like pins and needles. And I remember asking a friend, I was like, oh, when do you stop work? What, at what part of the pregnancy do you stop worrying? And then they said, try 50 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they're when like, we're dead, once you become it, a parent, you know, like, God willing, yeah. we live that long. Like, <laughs> the like worry you... will never stop. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. No, it won't. Do you ever like your stop. story? Do you? Yeah. And we have. You, you came and you were more amazing than I thought you would be. Like, I couldn't even have imagined. Yeah. No, I couldn't have even imagined. Yeah. I don't know. I just, I feel like we moved to this city that it's not this big city where you think, oh, you're going to have access to all these amazing things. We come from a place like New York. And I feel like we've had our quality of services and... to bring her into this world have been I think nothing short of world class. So it makes me, it's actually kind of neat to be thinking about telling the story about Richmond in the context of even Richmond because the story started somewhere else, but yeah. being here has made bringing her into the world just like easy, not easy, but easier yeah. and more calming. Yeah. All things considered. It's yeah. Easy. Yeah. And now we have to really acclimate ourselves to raising a child here. Like, we don't, <laughs> we don't know much about Richmond. Yeah. Um, I, I was, like, pushing pushing her on a walk in a stroller, and I've, I see this other mom who walks dogs and and pushes a stroller. And, like, I want to become friends with her so I can... Do you need me to go with you one day? <laughs> yes. Michelle's the introvert. I'm, uh, I yeah. need you to get me out of my shell. Well, you know, when you have a baby, people come visit you, which is great. So we've also had lots of... <laughs> Um, lots of family and friends come visit, and that's joyful. And um, my family li lives in the area, and so having Camila be near her cousins and 
aunts and uncles is so fun and grandparents and then and, yeah and then when we introduced her to her helper daddy's parents and family and that was so amazing and we're thinking this child just has so much which love. is what we hoped we hoped um, like she'll always feel extra love and extra special from all the but extra. not too extra special well, okay she can't be a, like a spoiled little brat and DJ, Tracy, so. she's not <laughs> I'm just saying, this, this is a problem. But it's, there's nothing wrong with extra love. No, no, of course, extra love. And she is special, but she's not, you know. Yeah, but she's got extra grandparents to love on her. Special. And extra, oh, extra aunts and uncles. The rules love. apply to you. It's okay. A love, it's a love on her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why don't you use your own hand? <laughs> All right, my name is Laura Berkey, and I am from Richmond, currently living in the Glen Allen area with my husband, Brian, and daughter, Mackenzie. I met Brian six years ago. We've been married for four years um, and, you know, soon started a family after we got married, and our daughter was born in 2013, and we have a second daughter that was born in 2015 in July of 2015. And shortly after she was born, there was some noticeable um, jerking movements and they didn't know why. So she went to the NICU um, to be monitored and to see if anything you know they did could help and it didn't. So then we were transferred to another hospital um, in Richmond because they had the capacity, the you know, the medical things um, needed to help her to try to figure out what was wrong. Um, but it only progressed and they ended up being seizures. And we didn't know why she was having these seizures um, until she was probably about six weeks old. We got some testing back and she had a never seen before gene mutation that affected sodium channels in her brain so there we were told there really wasn't anything that they could do um, for her um, medicate they were trying to medicate and help with the seizures but they were just progressively getting worse um, and eventually um, we were told she was not gonna live probably very long um, and then she did, she passed away on September 15th, 2015, um, in our arms, um, very peacefully. And that is all that I prayed for was just peace, peace for her. Um, after her passing, we wanted her cremated so that she could be with us in certain special places for the rest of our lives. Um, and we also got a um, rose bush as a memorial that's in our backyard with a couple bunnies representing Mackenzie and the small one representing Madeline, which is nice. I like looking at it from the sink and seeing the blooms and it makes me feel like she's, you know, still here with us, even though she's her, you know, she's physically not here with us. Mackenzie understands that she has a sister in heaven um, and that she was sick and and she asks questions um, like who's taking care of she calls her Maddie who's taking care of Maddie in heaven um, and so you know as much as an almost three-year-old can understand we explain um, yeah she she gets it at first, sometimes she still thinks that this, she calls this baby Maddie, and I'm like, no, this is a new baby, and you know, I have to explain that. But, um, but she, yeah, she understands. I consider the medical um, staff at the hospital part of our family, and maybe not 10 years from now, but um, I keep in touch with a lot of the nurses, the main nurses on her team. Um, pretty regularly and I think I, I feel that they are an extension of our family because when you go through such an emotional experience they were there they saw us 
in in this really difficult time and um to me that family sees people in you know very hard times um private moments i guess is what i'm trying to say um which you automatically become close through that i mean the circumstances are not good but you it just brings people together um for us um I didn't know and I and I can speak for Brian he wasn't sure how to to even fathom the idea of having another baby after something so unexpected happening um, especially with genetics um, it was just a fluke it just happened and the chances of it happening again very low but you know um, but I we knew we wanted to have another one. It was just preparing ourselves for the long road <laughs> ahead. Um, and being a woman, it's it's very different from the man's perspective because you're carrying the child and, you know, just every little, you just worry about every little thing, especially because everything was supposed to be okay before. And I will say that it has been emotionally very trying for me um, grieving the the loss of one child while trying to prepare for the life of another with fears, fears, sadness, happiness, excitement um, for what the future may hold. It, it, it's been it's been a lot. It's been a lot. And I don't think actually a lot of people talk about that. <laughs> um, but yes, it's been it's been hard. So I'm really looking forward to having the baby. <laughs> Um, and extending our, you know, expanding our family once again. Um, so it, you know, we, we've gotten through it. We've gotten through it together is the most important thing. Well, I didn't, I didn't want to have three kids. <laughs> I only wanted to, I didn't want to be pregnant three times, but the desire, I guess the maternal, uh, desire, I won't say need, but desire to be a mom um is really strong and i think for me after losing her i did i i i felt i felt the loss like in my hands like there wasn't a baby to hold uh she never came home um things like that and i i just i knew i needed to do it again i would i was willing to go through it again um because it was just, it's an instinct, I don't know, for me. But not everyone's like that. But yeah, I mean, it's been a hard, a long road and I'm really looking forward to October 4th. <laughs> so I can see her, know everything's okay, and you know. But, but the balance between the mourning and the expecting the new baby, that has been the biggest struggle for me. And just so you know, I was purposely not I told myself I wasn't gonna cry so it's not I thought well you know I don't know if people hearing this are gonna think oh she's very non-emotional about losing her daughter but I I kind of have to I have to put it in a spot is it a little one yeah. let me see it oh. mine's right here Ooh, right. can I trade can I have that one no. yeah. thank you I welcome you back you know, this side set for Madeline and her baby pictures, and then the other side for Mackenzie. And actually, the two on the bottom are at the lake where we spread her ashes with Brian's family. We're saving this one for the new baby as our family grows. But we'll always have pictures out of everybody. I think that we learned a lot of lessons life lessons um, from Madeline and what can happen when something so unexpected and, and, and tragic occurs, uh, but there were so many positive things and some of those positive things are what now I feel is an extension of our family. Um, and then drawing us closer together and not taking things for granted. Um, you know, you're not supposed to lose a child. So I think that when that happens, you really see 
how supportive your family is and what you can learn together from it. Bueno, yo lo conozco uh, uh -huh. prácticamente porque somos casi todos familia. A mi prima, mi esposa, mi papá, mi tío, el esposo de mi prima. Y el señor Pepe llegó por un primo mío que también lo trajo. Mi nombre es Octavio Vega, ya es mi nombre ha sido pronunciado. Uh, duré más o menos como cinco años y medio en otro trabajo allá en, en Nueva York. Uh -huh. Pero uh, cuando la cosa se puso fuerte, que que estaban las cosas, eh, el trabajo estaba muy flojo, poco salario, la renta muy cara. Yo dije, pensé, voy a tener que hacer algo. Llamé a mi jefe y él me dijo, ven a trabajar acá, que aquí te, te tengo un trabajo fijo, porque ya me conocía. Entonces él me trajo a mí por tres semanas, me gustó, tenía ya trabajo y a las tres semanas busqué mi apartamento y y comenzó la emigración. Um, my name is Josefina Gonzalez. I am from the Dominican Republic. I got to the United States when I was turning 18. I was pregnant with my first baby. And um, um, it was very exciting to get to the United States. I loved everything about New York, but as I got to know New York more and more, the traffic, the weather was too cold. The schools were not very suitable for the children. I decided to move to Virginia and I loved it since I came. There was a lot of vegetation, there was no traffic, the schools were great and I loved it and I still like Virginia very much. Mi nombre es Delio Vega. Llegué al Bronx en Nueva York en 1993. Duré ocho años. Traje tres hijos conmigo. Mi esposa quedó en Santo Domingo. Estudiaron ahí este, ocho años después nos mudamos aquí a, a Richmond, Virginia. Mi nombre es Felipe Paulino, como le dije hace un ratito. No, llegamos aquí es buscando un futuro, eh, así como, como le acabo de decir. Cuando vivíamos en la ciudad de New York, eh, trabajábamos eh, para vivir el día a día. Cuando nos tocaba llegar el lunes, que cobrábamos el sábado, ya el lunes nos tocaba eh, volver a trabajo ya que estar buscando cora para el toque del tren porque todo quedaba en la renta por lo menos acá uno dice trabajé esta semana pero me quedó 100 dólares con esos 100 dólares yo puedo llevar a mis hijos a comer a un buen restaurante yo puedo llevar a mis hijos al cine eh, puedo llevar a mi familia hasta para el río porque tenemos rito cerca y el río está por ahí cerquitita tenemos Virginia Vista también cerca en New York a veces no nos queda ni para coger el toque del tren mi nombre es Cándida Natalia eh, Utate Hidalgo. Vengo de República Dominicana. Eh, conocí Estados Unidos gracias a mi esposo Otavio Vega, quien me pidió como novia y, me, y nos casamos aquí. Eh, estoy viviendo en Virginia desde el 2010. If I had to raise my children in the Dominican Republic, I don't think I would have made it. The no, the jobs. I couldn't have found the job that I have here. I, I have an advantage here, and it is that I speak two languages. And there, I wasn't even going to be able to get an education like I got it here, because our family were very poor. And um, so it, it's been, it would have been very, very hard to raise my children in the Dominican Republic, indeed. No, no, a ellos van y les gusta su país. Eso le ha inculcado yo que su país de origen es su país que no deben olvidarse de él. Ese país fue el que nos dio este cuerpo que tenemos. Y aunque estemos mejor aquí cómodos y todo, pero es nuestro país. No podemos olvidarlo. O sea, yo mismo me siento orgulloso cuando yo veo bandera dominicana bordeando en otros países de lo que sea. Mi país es mi país.
y le agradezco a este país porque me ha dado todo lo que tiene. Cuando yo llegué aquí a Virginia, eh, Octavio me consiguió trabajo en un salón de belleza. Yo no manejaba. Entonces, él tenía que levantarse muchas veces a las cuatro y algo de la mañana porque él tenía que llevar una de sus hijas, había una en una escuela y otra en otra. Entonces, él tenía que llevar una de sus hijas a la escuela. Yo también arrancar con él en el vehículo porque él tenía que dejar a su hija ahí en la escuela sin todavía comenzar el horario de clase, llevarme a mí que yo trabajaba para el aeropuerto que es bien lejos, había que coger dos aguas, y él tenía que dejarme a mí entonces como en un restaurante, sea un Zoe, sea un Madonna, algo, hasta que abrieran el salón donde yo trabajaba. Y él tenía que entonces arrancar para atrás al trabajo de él que entraba a las siete y media. Entonces, vivimos así par de años en ese en ese continua rutina todos los días, todos los días levantándonos a esa hora, igual para ir a buscar, ¿no? que él tenía que buscar a su hija a las cuatro y algo de la tarde y ya en la noche, a veces a las 8, a las 9, yo le llamaba cuando ya yo terminaba de arreglar la última clienta, yo le llamaba y le decía ven a buscarme, tenía que arrancar prender su vehículo e ir a buscarme a mí al trabajo para entonces al otro día otra vez a lo mismo. Y mis hijos, eh, como se cre crecieron aquí en los Estados Unidos, fueron a la universidad de aquí, porque yo siempre le inculcaba eso, estudien. Yo le ayudo a pagar todo para que estudien, porque, para que no dejen el estudio por un trabajito. Y gracias a Dios, Dios me ayudó a, a que ellos pudieran estudiar. Pero ahora me lo agradecen a mí. Ya mis dos hijos más viejos tienen su casa de ellos propios. Sus hijos nacieron aquí y ya este, se sienten feliz y bien aquí. I think that uh, living here in Richmond has allowed us and my children to ha see their dreams come true. They, uh, my two daughters have gone to college. They had an education. This is something that I was not going to be able to do neither in New York or, or the Dominican Republic as a single parent that I was. Yo, yo quisiera que viniera mucha gente acá y que conocieran porque este estado es bueno de, de, de vivir. De, eh, hay buenas, buenas eh, universidades. Eh, la gente somos muy carismático. Eh, eh, somos bien fervorosos, nos gusta compartir. Si hagamos un par, nos invitamos, una fiesta, nos invitamos a todos y lo, y lo pasamos como en familia. Yo me siento como en la familia acá. Y nos sentimos feliz de la vida. Eh, ya traje a mis hijos acá, ya tenemos nuestras casas acá, eh, nuestra propia compañía. Nos sentimos como si estuviéramos en un pedacito de República Dominicana, pero ganando dólares, no ganando pesos. <risa> Somos americanos con los ojos negros, no con los ojos blancos. <ríe> sí. Entiende, que si yo aquí, todos estos son familias, son salones de belleza, restaurantes de toda clase, ¿tú me entiendes? Y yo llego aquí, este barrio como si fuera mío, yo camino, la gente me dice, el bohemio, el bohemio llegó acá, el bohemio, yo, te queremos. O sea, yo me siento bien por ese motivo. Uh, otra es la cosa que a mí no me importaba, he ayudado, yo, llegaban dos familias a mi casa, a, con, con hijos, a veces tenía que dejar un cuarto a él aquí, un cuarto allá, y los hijos y yo, si me juntaban dos familias, yo tenía que buscarle apartamento a ellos y buscarle trabajo muchas vehículo? veces, Ajá. muchas veces llevarlo, manejarlo a, a, a su trabajo, pero ellos se han lanzado. Y, y, y yo quiero ser esa persona quien haya subido un poco, que con ayuda aquí de, de mi esposa pueda avanzar en el grupo, que la gente reconozca que hay un, que hay un grupo folclórico, eh, eh, arte, teatro, baile, baile canto, sí, poesía. que haga de todo, que haga de todo un poco, porque eso, yo soy esa persona, me, na, me gusta, siempre me ha gustado eso, 
y ahora con, con, quiero ayuda, quiero ayuda de, de, de la gente, de la comunidad. Que se integren. Que se integren a, a, al grupo Los Pioneros. Porque quiero hacer algo más. Todavía yo no he terminado en este, en, en esta, en este estado. Yo quiero seguir haciendo por la comunidad. Y quiero que, que la gente, que la comunidad me, me vea y diga, sí, vamos a ayudarlo. Porque sí, en verdad, lo que lo merecen. Por aquí cruzó un dominicano. Sí, aquí, aquí pasó, aquí cruzó un dominicano que sí quería hacer algo diferente, la diferencia de lo que es, de lo que había antes. Amando también al mismo tiempo este país que nos abrió la puerta. Mi nombre Israel María Vega Rodríguez. Oh, ¿Y ¿Cómo usted le gusta a usted a, a Richmond Virginia? ¿Verdad que sí? Sí. Mucho, ¿verdad? Sí. ¿Qué, ¿Qué usted me decía antes? Que le gustaba por lo mucho los árboles, las casas. Sí, todas las cosas que todo era bien. Muchos carros. Sí. Oh. ¿Cuántos años tiene? ¿Quién? Usted, ¿cuántos años tiene? A veces me olvida, mí. 96. Yo creo, yo creo que 96 años. ¿El mundo ha cambiado mucho? Bueno, yo lo hallo bien. <ríe> sí. Yo no me he estado sintiendo mal. <ríe> claro que sí. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a usted por... Pues por juntarse conmigo y que algo pudieron hablar. Sí, claro que sí, para mí es un gusto. Y yo veo que podemos tratarnos, que eso es una cosa que hace falta. Pero que uno a veces está muy lejos del oso, no, no, no puede. Usted quiere cantarle un chin, cántale un chin. ¿Qué clase de canto? Lo que usted quiere, está solo. Ay, no te lo Tú eres María, eres mi ilusión, con quien yo sueño, que yo otra como a ti no la adoro. Si estás lejos de mí, estoy padeciendo, y cada vez que recuerdo lloro, y cada vez que recuerdo lloro, princesa mía, no quiero yo. No quiero ir, si tú te alejas del lugar donde naciste, busca un cubano que te quiera como yo, que te adore y te venere hasta la muerte, comprendiendo la manera de quererte. Danos pasión, no sea ingrata, tus pasiones serán las que me matan. Con tu fama, tu lindero procede. Si sufro con amargura, tú eres una esencia de mi pena. Yo te lo juro, dulce amor mío, lo de mi angelo, lo de mi hogar. Yo te lo juro, dulce amor mío, lo de mi angelo, lo de mi hogar. Si sí, dime así como quieres que te peine, yo la la y con un peine sin dientes, yo la la quien ha visto caco caigo, yo la la se vi para presidente, yo la la no me llame por mi nombre, yo la la que ya mi nombre se acabó, yo la la llama por la flor cubana, yo la la que en el instante llegó. We learned the history of Jenna Park from our father because he knew that history having talk with the people on his route. You know, it, it was a different time. You know, the mailman was part of the community. So, you know, he knew all of the people in this neighborhood and he could tell us about what area, like where we live now, had been a nursery. And he said, and that's why the trees are lined up in a straight row. And 
So he knew all of that history even back then, uh, which was just amazing to think about, you know. And um, you know, our father was an interesting man, uh, born in 1920, and uh, he fought in World War II. He actually was uh, part of the force that landed in uh, Normandy on D-Day. Uh, he he uh, participated in the Battle of the Bulge, which was one of the uh, noteworthy battles of uh, World War II in the European front. Um, when he came back here to start his family, uh, we started out living in the projects in uh, uh, Chamberlain Avenue, and that, that place is still there too. So, you know, every time I come back to Richmond, I always drive by and say, oh, I used to live there. Um, but uh, he had started college at Virginia Union before the war. And so he had this hiatus, you know, in the middle. So from like 1942, uh, then the war, and he finally graduated in 1948. So when he got to graduate in 1948, he had two little kids following him down the aisle. That was my brother and myself in 1948 when he graduated. Yeah. Oh, one of the family rituals the mention of Daddy for quite a number of years delivering mail. And the reason he was there at three was because they started early in the morning. So in our house, there came a time when Daddy was up often before daybreak preparing to go to the post office. And Wilbur and I would be up right about that same time delivering newspapers. So if you look at that in a total sense, we sort of had the neighborhood covered as the streets on one side of Battery Park will be delivered to for a period of years, and the streets on the other side of Battery Park I delivered to, and the streets over the boulevard that it delivered uh, delivered yeah. mail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so it, was, it was quite a ritual that actually went on for several years. Well, the good thing about that was the fact that when you had that kind of presence, where you were walking the streets of the neighborhood every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, for years. You knew everybody, and everybody knew you. And even at the wake, at, at uh, my mother's wake, people were coming up to me and introducing themselves, and I go like, oh yeah, I remember bringing papers to your house. And, and of course they would remember, I don't look like I did when I was a paper boy, but <laughs> it, was, it was just you know a real, pleasure to, to see people and to have that connection. My name is Osiris Pula. I came to Richmond, Virginia back in 1991. When they closed the company, they invited me to come over to go down to work here in Virginia. And really, I asked him, Richmond, Virginia, where is Richmond, Virginia? I don't even know Richmond, Virginia was in the map. And they told me, yeah, pull I can work in Richmond, Virginia. I say, okay, I'm gonna give it a try. Now, uh, when I come over here in Richmond back in the 91, 1991, honestly, I can go to a supermarket and even argue with my wife in Hispanics and nobody pay attention to me. I mean, people will look over and just give me a look, but there was nobody that speaks English, I mean Spanish at all. Uh, finally, after three or four years, after that I have a, a whole group of people. So after that long, I feel like I'm home. No, there was, there was, it wasn't that many. I, I tell you, actually, I remember going back, I was so lonely here in Richmond that I used to go up the hill, play basketball with a brother. And I remember staying there, Vega, you won't believe me. I stayed there and played basketball to 10 o'clock at night. And I, I even remember jumping the fence and going into the Publix, uh, the high school uh, pool, and we just swim there and go home 10, 11 o'clock, and 6 o'clock back over here. I used to drive back then. Every day, every Friday, I used to get on my car at 12 o'clock, go home, go to New York. And I finally bring my family here after the school year was over back in 1992, August 
1992, they come back. They come over here. So in 1992, I have a full family here, so I sort of fade away from New York. So Mr. Vega managed to bring a whole lot of people, a whole wagon of people. Thanks to Mr. Vega, we have a tremendous amount of Dominicans here in Richmond, Virginia. I, I stayed one year, two months in an apartment. Uh, uh, in, when I was in an apartment... Did you ever uh, pay me rent? Huh? Remember when, when my car uh, hold the... Did he avoid the... Did he avoid the uh, do you ever pay me la renta? <laughs> All by myself. Thanks. Lonely. Me and my wife and the children. Only two, only two one. Well, Vega, today, today I have gray hair. I got some sparkle now. You know, those, those spots that you get when you get older. Now I got to call out more now. Now, you know, uh, I, I never have... Casa? I, I, I have no problem with... <laughs> I have no problem with money. You know everything now. It's good place but to it be. Was, uh, it was it was very good. It was uh, it's been a lot. Uh, it's been a good 26, 27 years here in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm happy every minute. From from day one, when I would when I was living in New York, I used to send my family on vacation to Santo Domingo, so they know a lot about Santo Domingo. They probably don't remember because they was five, six, seven, eight years old. But even to 12 years old, I took Chulo back to Santo Domingo, so they got. They got a sort of an understanding, and uh, and honestly, honestly, uh, all people like me, we keep our roots. I mean, we are we are attached to our uh, DNA, and that's something that we follow strictly. You still you still find a lot of lot of American Dominican. They carry a Dominican flag. They they love their country. They love their roots. And that's uh, how we keep the American and the Dominican spirit alive. We, we used to have a, uh, another group of people bef uh, that was here before me. They used to be called the, the tribe because there was so many, there, were, there wasn't that many of them. You know, back then, back in the 1990s, 1991, 1992, if you get to see more than five or six Hispanic people with the plain domino or getting together, you call them a tribe. <laughs> That's how rare it was. Well, you know, it, it, it's hard to get into, it's hard to, to get into, uh, it's hard to get into color, you know? It's very hard, it's, a, it's, it's something that not too many people want to talk about it, but as long that is, as long as it's color, it is color, you know. You're going to find people that that is still, back in 2016, do not accept our race. And I, you know, I wish, I wish these people out of luck. I mean, there, there was something that I got, I got three children here, well, not anymore, here in Virginia, and they hang around with all kind of people. They don't have no racial problem. I remember when they come to Monacan High School, they have a little bit of difficulty because there was uh, there was that many Hispanic here. So, but you know, it's something that that the Hispanic population must overcome with education, and education is the key. If you want to overcome anything that is against you, education is the key, and that's one of the things that I implemented to my family and everybody I know when it's come to a uh, racial problem. I, I never feel no, I got no problem with, with black, blue, purple, or others. Like I said from the beginning, you know, since I was lo lo alone here, I used to hop on my car every Friday. Every Friday, 12 o'clock, Vega, I go to New York and I buy all my yucas and my plantain from New York. Everything I needed. There was no, there was no uh, uh, Goya products here in, in none of the store. Everything was come from, from New York. And that's how I buy my platanos. And today? I today you got everywhere. Today everywhere. Today you got everybody speak campesino everywhere. <laughs>
My name is Elizabeth Tallheimer Smart, and I am the sixth generation of Tallheimers to live in America. My great 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 grandfather was William Tallheimer. He moved here in 1840 from Germany and came to Richmond, founded Tallheimer's Department Store in 1842 as a small dry goods store um, initially, and then it became bigger and uh, expanded as his children came into the business and subsequent generations came into the business. And against all odds, the store existed for 150 years here in Richmond and became sort of interwoven with our narrative as a community, so many Richmonders' lives. And um, I had the great joy and privilege of being able to write a book about this store and um, researched it, worked on it for about 12 years and was able to have the almost magical experience of interviewing my grandfather, who, when I was a child, was a very busy businessman. He really didn't have time to sit and tell stories and uh, recollect, reminisce. So by the time I was ready to write this book after graduating college, after living in New York for a few years, I moved back and had the time to sit down with my grandfather and interview him collecting notes that fill a binder about this thick. And he had the time and the patience and the interest to sit down with me and really tell me what he remembered and what his sort of family stories were that had been passed down to him. So he used to say timing is everything in the business and timing was everything with the writing and the piecing together of this story. Um, so I am really glad now to have this book to be able to pass it down to my own children who will never know what Tallheimer's was. They will never have experienced it. It's only a story. But not only that, I feel like the book has inspired Richmonders to come and tell me their stories. And just about everyone who grew up here has a story about Tallheimer's um, and about Miller and Rhodes, the store across the street. So it's something that really is a thread that ties so many people together and that's been kind of the um, unexpected joy of this book for me, of this journey, to gather those stories as well and be this recipient of all of these incredible, um, mostly family-based memories. Stores were different um, than they are now. They were really a place of um, community, community centers. They were a place of um, culture, they were not just places of transaction, they were places of interaction and of action, um, civil rights, of uh, so many important things, sort of the crux came together at the department store. So I feel like being able to tell my family's story has also been a journey to tell Richmond's story in some ways, and even greater than that, the story of the American South. So um, I do feel really lucky to have been gifted this story? Well, um, a lot of my stories are similar to um, the stories that people tell me, that I remember going downtown dressed up with my knee socks and my Mary Janes and little smock dresses um, to visit, you know, at Christmas time. That was a big deal to go up to visit my dad on the sixth floor and then we'd go visit Santa Claus. We'd go to the Snow Bear Breakfast hear Bruce Miller uh, sing with Snow Bear and um, have breakfast all together as a family. It was an occasion we looked forward to all year. And then of course the wonderful store windows were something that we would always sort of linger outside and look at because they were so um, amazingly artistic and interesting and sometimes had moving parts, little characters, especially around Christmas time. Um, so that was always, uh, that's, a memory that I have throughout childhood is going downtown to at Christmas time. But um, some of the more unusual family memories of going downtown are, this one's a little bit naughty actually. My sisters and I would go in the French room with my mom, which was the sort of upscale women's um, designer dresses. And while she was trying on dresses, we would sneak under the racks and we would actually pull the beads off of the wedding gowns. <laughs> I mean, don't do this kids, right? don't do this. That's the number one thing she didn't want us to do. And we um, collected the ones that fell. But also, if there was a really good rhinestone, maybe we would pull it off a dress, just maybe. 
And um, I actually still have a little box of those treasures that I was not supposed to take. I still feel bad admitting that, but we really did do that. Isn't that so bad? It was a really strange time when everything sort of came to an end. Um, you never know the end of the narrative as it's happening. And so it was very confusing to all of us that this could end, that after you know six generations and 150 years that your store really could just disappear and no longer be your livelihood and no longer be part of your identity. And really Tallheimer's was a part of our family. It was like a, it was our house in some ways. Um, so we never really thought it would ever end. When we sort of became cognizant that everything was coming to an end, well, first of all, my father lost his job, which is dramatic for anyone, any family. Um, but not only that, we knew that that meant that things were going to be coming to a close, at least as we knew them. Um, he was, you know, very stressed out at the time, very affected by it. He said he had a ringing in his ears that wouldn't go away for a long time. And um, I remember that my mom sat us down in the dining room table to tell us that dad had lost his job and that we needed to be nice to dad. And um, after that being really angry that the uh, May Company had come in and promised everyone that nothing would change and then everything was changing. And I wrote them this letter on my little personalized blue and white stationery saying, this is cruel and heartless and this is a family and you have no idea what you're doing to our family. And I wrote a very impassioned letter, signed it, sealed it and marched it up to the mailbox. We have a long driveway, so I marched it up to the top of the driveway, slammed the door on the mailbox, marched back down. And I guess my dad had seen me do this because he intercepted the letter before the mailman came and sat me down at the table and tore it up and said, you can't do that. Um, this is the way it's going to be. And this is just how things are going to change. And so at that point, I knew that there was nothing we could do. There was no going back. And on a personal note, that was where I always envisioned myself working. And so at the time I was 16, I was starting to imagine what my future might look like, what my first job might be. And of course I wanted to work at Tallheimer's. I had already you know, spent a day with Betty Botter in the advertising department. I was excited to start getting to know people there. And that was sort of like a rug was pulled out from under me. Um, and I had never thought about doing anything else. I had always wanted to be the first female president. Now at 16, you know, you may want to be an astronaut, you may want to be a famous actress, but that's, that's what I envisioned, that I would be the first female president. And I really wanted to prove to my grandfather that I could do that. And so I realized that day that I would never get that opportunity. And um, it may have turned out for the best, honestly, because I was able to realize that I'm a writer and that words are my talent. I don't think retail would have been my talent. And I had the opportunity to write about the store. So in fact, it did become this golden nugget of a story that I was able to tell and share. Um, so in some ways, maybe I did become the president of the department store. <laughs> yeah, they were definitely expectations of what a Tallheimer would wear, what a Tallheimer would behave like. And I probably didn't do any of those things. <laughs> Um, so I think it was interesting to escape that, but then also to have the chance to start afresh and to start our own family because the family continues. And interestingly, so many of us have stayed in Richmond. My cousins, my sisters, my parents, my aunts and uncles, many of us are still here. There's still a core Tallheimer family here. And I think a lot of what's kept us here is the sense of community and being a part of something bigger than ourselves. And I do think that's what remains. Um, you know, Tallheimer's is gone, Miller and Rhodes is gone, and sort of the um, hometown department store is a thing of the past. Um, it's been replaced by Amazon, it's been replaced by Target and shopping carts and Best Buy. But what remains is the sense of community and I think I realized when I launched my book and all of these people came together that it's about more than just a store, 
it's about people that were connected by something and by a common experience. Um, not only that, my grandfather used to drill into us that Tallheimer's was about honesty, integrity, quality, and service. And this is something that I talk to my kids about, and it gives us a good framework for telling them the story of the store. These weren't just some words that were assigned to them by some consultant. This was really how they lived day to day and how the store conducted its business. And so I feel like as a family, we can talk about those values and how we're going to enact them, how we're gonna make them real in this world that doesn't always place those values at the forefront. And it gives us a place to start fresh. And so I think that's the lesson from Tallheimer's that I wanna continue uh, teaching my own children and honesty, integrity, quality, and service. It's hard to argue with any of those. Um, so I feel like it's uh, the end of an era in some ways, but also the beginning of something new and something potentially very meaningful. And I want to convey to my kids how important it is to be a part of a community. Ultimately, that's what Tallheimer's created, was a community people wanted to be a part of. What was scary? Um, it was quite scary when, when I signed the first contract. It was for five years, and we had a one-year escape clause, and I was going, God, can I make it a year? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the year flew by pretty quick, and like I said, didn't get a salary, but we paid the bills, and we had the customers coming in. Sheila Brooks. I've been doing this for about 38 years um, and started out as a receptionist and built myself up to owning my own shop. Um, Cliff decided to, to uh, try his hand at it. It's done quite well and went on and got his license and we opened a shop together. And Cliff's enjoyed it. I have. It's been a good, good venture for us. We just celebrated 16 years and going strong. And every person is unique and individual as far as what their likes are. And um, it makes it really fun to help someone find that unique look that they like uh, or have been looking for. Um, sometimes they get in a rut and they want a different change. And uh, it's, it's neat to be a part of that. So that's what I enjoy about it. I think as far as working with family, um, we do quite well. Cliff and I click. Um, of course, sometimes, you know, you bump heads. Um, he thinks I buy too much um, <laughs> and fusses at me about that. Um, but then he, he says, okay, mom, you're running the show. So, uh, you know, he knows that I'm going to do what I want to do and he's going to do what he wants to do. So, right. okay. We, but basically, I think we get along pretty good. Yeah, we we always uh, I mean, we get along really well. Uh, like like she was saying, we do bump heads occasionally. But the neat thing, I always tell her with family, you can be honest. <laughs> Here, if I tell her I think you're wrong, I tell her, and then she'll give me the answer too. You know, so it's not sugar coated. So, but I think it helps because you kind of get everything out in the open and then you work on resolving what you think you know you need to do to get it resolved so so that's the neat thing but in all parts of it we, we really don't have that many arguments or disagreements or anything like that so um, and we're pretty open with each other uh, it's like she'll say hey what do you think about this 
You know, like, yeah, that sounds pretty cool, but what if we do this, do add this little spin? She's like, yeah, I didn't think of it that way. That was, yeah, let's, you gotta get let's different views. try that. So we like to brains, brainstorm off of each other. So um, that works really good. And, um, and then I get to see my mom every week, so. <laughs> so it's, it's unique because we have that bond of optical and um, share that experience together. And if I learn something, I'll show her. And if she learns something, she'll go, hey, look at this. I learned this and check this out. And uh, so it's, it's, it's unique and it's cool. So I like it. Yeah, I send him to all the meetings. <clears throat> Take notes. <laughs> so I don't have to sit through them. <laughs> so he comes back with all the information that we need to stay on top of things. And uh, he does all the Facebook stuff too. I grew up in a farm on, uh, in actually Midlothian. Um, so I was a farm girl. And I grew up with my grandparents. And they came here from Hungary. And um, I grew up um, in that area and we were hands on. I mean, it was a full full farm. So I think that's what helps me here because I'm used to um, fixing things, not just running to the store and picking up things. You know, we, we grew um, our own food, we canned it, and um, it, it's helped me here. I um, actually was a high school dropout, and <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad, but I, got, I went back and um, got my education and went to Jay Sarge for some classes and uh, been doing this for a long time and enjoy it. So, and Cliff had it a little easier than I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't have the farm. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have the farm. He didn't even but, like uh, to pull grass out of the yard, <laughs> out of the driveway. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we grew up in Chesterfield. So, um, grew up in Chesterfield, and um, so Richmond was already, we always came to Richmond when we wanted to uh, do something uh, different that wasn't in Chesterfield, um, like some of the unique restaurants, um, uh, some of the old movie theaters and stuff like that. So that was, uh, when I was growing up, that's what we used to come to Richmond to do. You used to, when my parents were younger, they actually lived in Richmond too. Yeah, in a fan. Uh, yeah, so and the fan has changed. Um, it's <laughs> so. like all the buildings are getting more um, uh, upgrades, and uh, yeah, we 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 were hit little hippies then. Um, <laughs> yeah, the long hair, and um, I don't were, remember it, but yeah, uh, you, well, you were just. I a was little, a baby, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was in the seventies. You're, so. sh you're showing my age now. Yeah, you, he thinks he's still a baby. <laughs> He's always had a pretty level head. <laughs> yeah. um, no, he he did his he did a couple of goofy things when he was in a band, and they did a couple of goofy things. Yeah, I mean, rock rock and roll has always been in Richmond, so we used to come up here to see small town bands and stuff like that. So. Yeah, he had so the long hair. Unique. Oh, he was the <laughs> he was like. I don't know. He was a rocker. It was the 80s. So everybody in the 80s had long hair. <laughs> uh, so it's neat to be able to actually work here in Richmond and be a part of it so, and help to uh, grow the community and um, grow small businesses because it was declining, but now it seems to be coming back and, and it's been a uh, great experience. So. He has a younger brother. Um, who helps us out with the computer once in a while because he's a computer whiz. And um, my husband comes in, he's, uh, he's, he is maintenance. So anytime we have a light out or have a maintenance problem, we call him in and say, hey, <laughs> we need you. <laughs> so he, he's good hands on, so, but yeah, yeah. And Cliff has two sons, yeah. So maybe we have a future of keeping on the uh, books. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might be an optician too. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Um, I mean, sometimes you'll see in the news, you'll see something that's in the news and it's kind of like, wow, I can't believe that's happening here. But, um, I mean, Richmond is a fairly large city compared to uh, a little small town. Uh, but, um, no, I mean, it's always, it's just, it's just home, so I guess I don't know anything other than Richmond.
My name is Helen McKeever. Uh, it used to be Helen Silvette, and I married Bob McKeever many years ago, so it changed. And my father was David Silvette. His father was Ellis Meyer Silvette. They were both portrait painters. My two aunts in that family were portrait painters also. And oddly enough, they all won awards at the Cochrane Art Gallery in uh, Washington, D.C., the whole, f all the family. So I have, a, I guess, a rich history, and people always ask me, do you do art? No. I spent one year with my father teaching me in between my marriages, and I hated it, and finally had to break his heart and say, I just don't like it. And I know the reason, it's very hard. And I didn't realize until he tried to teach me how hard it is to, to do anything like that. But this portrait behind me is one of my favorites, and I never saw it until my father was ready to die. And he had things like this in his basement, all dirty. This is of my grandfather. My father painted it when he was 16 years old, and I think it's pretty amazing. My grandfather was, I think it was Herman Jacob Silverberg, and he wasn't getting any painting jobs. So he decided to change everybody's name, the four kids, his wife, and his name, so they weren't Jewish anymore, because he thought that might be why he wasn't getting work. And it turned out it was. He became French. He told the kids they were from this little tiny town in France, which no one had heard of, so no one could ask him any questions that would be wrong. And this was when they were, his kids were teenagers, so they became the Sylvettes. And uh, my grandfather played in the symphony in Pittsburgh, so he's multi-talented. He also, which I think is interesting, was solicited by Thomas Edison and several other people of his generation, uh, Harvey Firestone, Henry, Henry Ford, to do their portraits. The one he did the most was Edison. He did 12 all alike of Edison standing to put in the 12 buildings Edison owned. My immediate family is very small. It's me, my mother, and my father, <laughs> and I currently have four sons. Uh, but we didn't have a good or bad family life. The thing I found interesting, I grew up thinking it was normal for the state police to park out front every day and people to come and go. And starting when I was about eight, it was my job during the summers and holidays. And my father worked a lot on weekends because that's when famous people were free. And I had to fix their lunch for these people. And they'd sit in the dining room and I would have to entertain them because he needed a break before he went back to painting them. His studio was in the backyard down a hill. Uh, if, they need to, if they were women, they came up to the house to go to the bathroom. If they were men, they had to go to the bathroom behind the little studio house back there. He had a lean-to back there. And I remember I was at UVA in college and came home and there were all the state police there and my parents just said to me, don't ask any questions. So I didn't. And what it turned out to be, Godwin, our governor, had had a portrait painted of him because they, there is a portrait of every governor hanging in the or not hanging, if, if they're old, they're stored, store, but they're portraits of every governor in existence. Godwin didn't like the one the state commissioned of him. So he had it destroyed and paid for my father to do one, which he liked. And that's why the state police were there. They were bringing Godwin, the governor, to have his portrait painted. But it was a secret because nobody knew the other one was destroyed. <laughs> so I thought that was interesting as a, I guess I was a late teenager then. Uh, I know my mother sold a lot of things I wish she hadn't. Things, for example, F. Scott Fitzgerald autographed books that he had done, written, famous books, to my father, to my mother, and my mother sold all this stuff when she got older because she wanted money. She was afraid she'd be poor. So, so I have none of that left because she sold it, but I've seen it. Well, I shouldn't have none, I have some, but not much. So my father, my grandfather's purpose was to make money. He wanted money. And he made enough after he changed his name and painted these famous people so that he could put my grandmother on one of the old ships and in the old regalia that, I don't even know what it looks like, I have pictures. And they went to Europe and had a big vacation. So he did well. And he painted a portrait of Robert E. Lee, which I thought was huge and in reality it's not. It's not even life-size, probably, this big. It's at the White House of the Confederacy. It doesn't hang. 
uh, but I went down to see it after my father died, and my grandfather did the painting, and he did prints from it, which he sold for three dollars each, and one of Lee's lieutenants was still alive, so the lieutenant wrote a letter about how much this painting was exactly like Lee, and that was included along with the, the color print and something else in a folder, and my grandfather sold them for three dollars each, but he made enough money to go on the Queen something to Europe. Well, I have two large paintings upstairs, which I had never seen until my father was dead, and then in his basement I found them. They were dirty, and one of them is Noah's Ark. It's a picture of a nude Noah, and he has people around him, and, and another one is a very large painting of civil rights, which would be how many years ago? Well, lots of years ago. And that one, apparently, someone offered me when my father died 100000 for it, and I said, no, nothing's for sale period, for any amount, but it sure was tempting, and uh, it's got to do with Civil War, and this is very interesting, because there's a little baby, people posed for this, not the real people, but people posed, and he paid them, there's a baby in the corner of it, and the baby is now older than I am, which she's about 80, and a couple of years ago, she called me from Wisconsin and said, I'm the baby in that painting, I want to find it, I want to see it before I die. I said, well, it's upstairs in my house. So she came from Wisconsin. She called the newspaper here. So did she come by herself? She came with an entourage from the newspaper and they did an entire spread on the whole painting. She knew a lot more about it than I did. And so she could die now because she had seen herself as the baby in this painting. So that was very interesting too. All kinds of things seem to come up. Well, my, hus my second husband has been dead for over 12 years, and he got me started many years before that in rescue work. And I don't know what he thought I was going to do, but I guess he thought I was going to be bored. And he complained once and said, you spend too much money on the animals. And so I said, would you like me to take up golf and belong to a club? And he said, sure. I said, would you like me to go with the girls skiing at Wintergreen every weekend? Sure. I said, well then don't you tell me what to do with my spare time. No more anything about animals again. He was happy with everything. But I started with one from the SPCA, a cat, which had ringworm, it was right before Christmas, 25 years ago, and they were gonna kill it because ringworm is contagious. So that was back in the days when you just kill these things. And I got it well, and the woman who gave it to me had a home for it already, so it was very easy. So I did another one that was easy, and then next thing you know, they had an emergency, so that meant I had two rooms with animals in it. Well, then, before I knew it, the whole house was full. There are nine bedrooms in this house. Everything was full. All the bathrooms were full. Bathrooms were relegated to moms and kittens, and I'm not a hoarder, and I'm legal in the city, but it was an awesome, hard job. So I've had to have help off and on and the older I get, the more help I have to have. But I have resigned, and I don't do much anymore except behind the scenes, and I still have a lot of animals. And they are my babies, they're my children. Uh, they go to the vet before I do anything for me. Uh, today they had fresh chicken I cooked for them in the crock pot, and they're rejecting that, so I'm not sure what we're gonna do next. But I think animals are wonderful. And I like children too, but mine are grown and they don't need me anymore. An animal needs a person, and that's just the best feeling in the world. He's my baby. Mama, Mama baby. His name is Little Buddy. The girl at the vet named him, because I named him Dog. And she said, that won't work. But he's so cute to me. Is he behaving? Okay, we moved to Richmond in 1970 from Philadelphia, and in Philadelphia, 
we lived in a very unusual community. It was multiracial, multi-class. Uh, we had a cooperative nursery school that combined very poor people with uh, richer people. We were fighting all the social issues as a community. It was a very strong community. Um, then we moved to Richmond in 1970 and uh, the schools were just being desegregated. And we moved uh, to, fortunately, to the north side, uh, which they called the Presbyterian Ghetto. <laughs> and uh, the people there were just wonderful and liberal, and they were sending their children to the schools uh, <clears throat> uh, as, as requested, whereas many people weren't. Uh, so we enjoyed living there. And then there was the question of the swim pool. Uh, the Ginner Park Swimming Club pool um, I did not accept blacks at that time. So uh, with our background, we could not support such a pool. So we learned there were a group of people in uh, Gitter Park who felt the same way, and they um, built a pool in another area. And so we joined that pool, and blacks joined the pool, and it was just people from the fan joined the pool. I mean, it was a wonderful opportunity to meet people of other races and really get to know them and our children mixed. And like sometimes we would go picking peaches and then the kids would come and put up a stand outside the, the pool and sell them to people. It was just, and we'd have special events there. And it was a real interracial community, which, which we were very happy about. One of the other things that I, I remember that was so important to our lives when we moved here was the Presbyterian School of Christian Education. And they, um, they had a wonderful roller skating rink in their basement. And our kids would go there and roller skate. It was just wonderful. It was a great place for the kids to hang out and have a good time. So the Presbyterian School of Christian Education was a very important recreational plus for living in Richmond to us. We really used that well and our kids enjoyed it and met other kids. I became a single mom when my kids were, I believe, six, eight, and 10. Um, we're still pretty young and um, that was hard. So I had to go back to the workforce. So uh, I applied for various jobs and I got one with the state office on aging uh, as a field rep. And it paid well and they let me come in late to get my kids on the bus and, and uh, it had good benefits. But I wanted to do something I really had a passion for. And my passion in life has been the out of doors. I mean, after race relations, uh, past, uh, social justice issues, my passion has been being outdoors and doing long adventures. So I made the big decision to um, quit that job at, with the state and uh, go back for eight months to v VCU. And then I needed a, a way to get trained further, some experience, so I could get a job in the field. And I went to um, an environmental ed school in um, um, near Antioch College in Yellowstone, Yellow Springs, Ohio. And they offered me an internship, which was just a perfect opportunity because kids came there every every week from different fourth grades, and you were their leader, teaching them about the environment, and uh, and you were learning from a better naturalist above you. But anyway, so I I got accepted, which I was very excited about, but um, uh, they wouldn't let me come as a parent and bring my children. So it never occurred to me that wanting to get a new career would involve leaving my children. But uh, to make a long story short, I, their father agreed to take them for a year. And uh, I got my training. Uh, that was a very hard decision, but I made it. I figured they'd get to know him better. Um, <laughs> so two years, this is two years of leaving my kids for one year and then searching across America and then here, not giving up, that's all in my book, A Cotton Rat for Breakfast. Um, 
a cotton rat for breakfast, adventures in midlife and beyond. It was a real struggle, uh, and it was hard on my family, but I'm not sorry I did it. It was the right thing for me. It took a lot of courage, and that's what I talk about. I have a, Then I started a business, Make It Happen, uh, where I talked about some of my adventures, and then it turned into more talking about creative aging and what you can do as a senior and this whole new 20 years of living, you know, that you've got between retirement and frail old age and what a wonderful, wonderful period of life it can be. You can go after all those things you didn't have time to do in middle age. That's what I've been doing. I've had a ball in my 24 years. And, um, and my kids, you know, my kids grew up. I don't want to ignore them in this and they're very successful. They they survived <laughs> my uh, motherhood or what have you, and uh, and I'm very proud of them. But um, we're not a perfect family, you know. We try our best, and uh, so uh, as a family, we are in pretty good touch. And uh, the kids are also in touch with their dad, who's having uh, uh, Bob, who's having a fair amount of of health problems, and they're very good about uh, visiting him and helping him out and stuff like that. So, you know, we're doing pretty well considering <laughs> that this house <laughs> is where we lived when we first moved to uh, Richmond in Northside on Brook Road. And then I had to give that up uh, the year I went away uh, to change careers because I don't have any money to pay rent or what have you. So, but when I came back, uh, it was a real struggle to find a house and get all the kids back. Very difficult period of my life. But eventually we rented another house, this beautiful house here on, uh, on Westwood and corner of Westwood and Noble. And it was wonderful. Josh was away at school, college by then. But um, my girls and I lived there and there were only two bedrooms, a small house. The only two bedrooms, but I put a curtain in the dining room and slept there so they could have their separate bedrooms because at their dad's, they didn't have room. He had some stepchildren and they had shared a room. Um, and that was, uh, it was, it took a while to settle in that house. We, we, we lived in two other places before we got there, but we finally settled down. And, uh, but when you're going to do adventures like I did, you have to sacrifice some things in order to be able to afford to do them. I followed my dreams, but in order to follow your dreams, you have to give up some things and, and it's hard, but your dreams can be pretty important. <laughs> so I believe you should go for them, you know, not hurt people going for them, but be sensible and go for them. And when I came back, um, when the kids left and I retired, I had two goals to hike the Appalachian Trail all the way and to ride my bike across America. So I, I uh, was successful at riding my bike across America uh, and I uh, succeeded in doing the Appalachian Trail after failing a couple times, but it took me uh, nine years to finish it and I finished it 10 days before I turned 71. And I was really, behind my, uh, I was getting behind, you know, I was really, I was really pushing it. So my retirement has been fabulous in terms of writing my books, learning to be a speaker, and doing adventures. You, you do different things. I was very devoted to my children. <sighs> And I think they like me. <laughs> when I got when I got to the ocean, and I was at the Pacific Ocean with and and I called went to a phone booth, no cell phones, and I called my son, and he was a mentor, at uh, he was in graduate school at a college in uh, in uh, Florida, I think Florida State, and he was a mentor at one of the dorms or the houses. So I called, and he wasn't in, and I said, well, I'll just tell him that his mother has reached the Pacific Ocean. Oh, you're the lady who hiked the whole Appalachian Trail. You're going across, they had my whole history. He never says a word about it, you know.
But apparently he brags about it everywhere, but he doesn't tell me. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's interesting when things like that pop up and you realize your children are really proud of you. And, uh, and when I wrote my book, which was really hard because it did involve them, and they didn't always agree with what I said, but it was my memoir, and I changed some things. But my daughter, my son, uh, sent me a note and sent me $500, and he said, uh, I know you're really having trouble putting colored pictures in that book because they're so expensive and I want to help. And unbeknownst to him, my daughter sent me a check for $500, and she had been quite critical, my Susan daughter, about some of the parts of the book. Um, and she said, this will be a great thing for your children to have in the family. So, you never know. <laughs>
to say um, is the way that I understood it. Um, so, of course, um, it, it didn't work trying to keep us apart, and we found later, later on that we really weren't sneaking out because the boy who was getting me out, his mother was very good friends with my parents and they knew all along <laughs> that we were supposedly sneaking out. So it really wasn't a secret in the first place. So my parents were just putting up with it is what we found out later after um, Bruce asked for my hand in marriage from my father um, I was able to go up to New York and get a Chinese dress made custom fit for me because there was always a banquet the night of the wedding, a Chinese wedding. I had to go, like I said, to New York to get the dress made and I got to pick out the material and it took several weeks um, for them to make it and then I got to go up there again and that was his, um, Bruce's aunt helped buy the dress and when I went up there I had to have it fitted and then we got to bring it back. When we got married, I didn't want to get married in the church, of course, and I didn't want to get married in a temple. So we got married at our friend's backyard in the middle of August. It was really, really hot. So we had a big banquet and um, it was about 20 courses of different Asian food and um, my friends were invited and we really had a good time for the whole day celebrating our marriage together and um, we've been married since 1975. <laughs> so. <laughs> We were dating in 1969. It wasn't until 1966 that Virginia allowed interracial marriages, that it was against the law before 1966, which, you know, I never knew that. I mean, I was sheltered from that, but it was something that I never knew that I figured I should have known, but, you know, uh, anyway. My first child was born in 1977, and she was born at Richmond Memorial Hospital, where Bruce happened to work. And um, that having her definitely brought the families together, having the first granddaughter. And we just had a ball after that with her and celebrating all the birthdays, the holidays, and we had also had to do Hanukkah and Christmas, and we also celebrated Passover um, while the kids were still young and my parents were still around. And um, my second child was, our second child was born in uh, 1980 and um, he was a son and I was glad that I had a son and so I had two and I didn't have to have any more <laughs> and um, we just became a complete family and everybody was happy and healthy for a long time. The great-grandparents were still around and we just all get along very well now so the cultures meshed very well
I remember one, one Christmas, and Christmas was a big deal for us. It was a really, really big deal. And we had, um, um, she and my father had gone to church over in Southside. And, you know, I don't know if, you know, we may not want to talk about this too much. We had a situation where there were things in the car. Um, for the next morning. I'll just put it like that. And she had asked my dad, don't leave the things in the car, you know, outside of church. When it came out of church, the things were no longer in the car. And this was Christmas Eve at about 11 o'clock at night. And of course, back in the 60s, there was no Walmart open all night long. So, so something had to be done because the next morning was Christmas. And fortunately, in that four family apartment building, my godmother actually lived upstairs. And so she always had something for me. And so they were able to make that thing work. And, um, and they, they did tell me that Santa had been robbed. And I went to school the following week and said, well, you know, Santa was robbed. And all my friends said, well, we got our things. And so I came home and I asked my mom, I said, everybody else got their things. What, what, what is this? And she said, you were the last house on the route and that's how, <laughs> and I accepted that because it was like, all right, well, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> so my mother was very, very quick to be able to respond with something okay. that would allow us to um, learn a lesson. I guess is the best way that I can put it. I, you know, um, she just just was was always, and I don't know how she did it, but you know, because one of the things that she always talked about was. Well, you know, she always would say, you know, I didn't go to college because my dad graduated from college. My mother did not. And it was always, well, you know, I didn't go to college. And still, she was one of the smartest people I've ever met. She managed that household. She managed all the finances. She made sure that my sister and I developed a, uh, and I mentioned us specifically because we were the girls. And so she made sure that we developed a sense of confidence and a sense of, 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 of direction so that we would grow up and be professional women because that's what she wanted for us. And she ensured that that's what we were going to get. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, you want to hear about Christmas and weird stories, when we lived on North Avenue, I don't know why, but Daddy always thought it wasn't a good idea to go out and buy a Christmas tree. <laughs> oh, this is great. <laughs> yeah, this is great. <laughs> so he wouldn't go buy a Christmas tree. He would wait till Christmas Eve when they shut down, the tree vendor shut down and threw out the trees on the dump. So Christmas Eve, we spent out getting the Christmas trees that had been thrown out. Rarely did we get one tree. Mm -hmm. Usually we got several, so we'd come in and it was kind of like a Christmas tree fashion show and picking out the one, <laughs> one we want. I don't know of anybody else who ever did anything quite like that <laughs> in Be fact, before or since. It was such a tradition. I, I, as a child, thought that Santa brought the tree because when I went to bed Christmas Eve, there was no tree. And when I got up Christmas morning, there was a tree. So I just assumed that Santa had brought the tree. And for years, I brought, bought a live tree for my house and waited until Christmas Eve to get it. Now, at, at, there came a point where you could no longer get them free. Um, but I would wait until Christmas Eve just because it was a tradition until my children got old enough to say, why are you waiting until Christmas Eve to get the tree? And then finally, and I would refuse to have an artificial tree. And then one year, my sister took me out to get my tree on Christmas Eve and there were no trees. And we ended up having to go to Lowe's and purchase an artificial tree. It was the first time I ever had one. And I said, for the price I paid for it, I'm gonna have to put this tree up for five years. And I did, but um, but I tried I tried to keep the but tradition alive. But you got it on sale. I did. I got it for so half price. At least it was on sale. Y'all didn't check the dump. No, <laughs> because they had built the school on top of the dump. There, there was no dump. I, 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 the one time that that we failed that I remember, uh, we went out with you know my brother and I and my father went out looking and we we had lots of places that we knew we had to go to and we couldn't <laughs> find a whole tree. <laughs> so we just gathered up all of these pieces and we actually stapled and glued and <laughs> taped and we made a tree. We made a tree. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the next morning I thought Santa had brought the tree. <laughs> <laughs>
And we live in the north side of Richmond. I had a coworker that had signed up for a workshop, a leadership uh, workshop for nonprofits, and she couldn't attend. So she asked me if I would like to attend in her stead, and it wasn't coming out of my budget. So I said, yes, please. And two days later, I met Lindsay in that nonprofit leadership class. And um, yeah, and I worked there. So I was taking the class and I just heard her voice and I was like, ooh. And I looked back and I was like, I don't know her. So I started texting to say, who is this Nicole Priest? Who knows her? Of course, immediately, very quickly, someone knew her. Um, <laughs> and it just kind of went quickly after that. Well, we waited a long time for Zora. Uh, we were we were trying to have her for years before she finally came to meet us. Um, and so we're grateful every day. She's seven months old. Mm -hmm. She was just born in February. Yeah, on our very first date, which Nicole did not know was a first date, but it was definitely a first date, um, we talked about how we both wanted to have kids. And that was always something that was really important to us. It was an anniversary present, really, because we'd already made our commitment to one another three years before. On the same day. Yeah, on the same day. Marriage became legal in the Commonwealth of Virginia on our anniversary. Yeah. So it, it, it became important to have that legal connection to, some, yeah. to a commitment we made three years before. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Um, when we had Zora, one of the really awesome things was right from the beginning, both of our names got to be on the birth certificate, um, which was huge. That wouldn't have happened um, previous to us being able to be married. Yeah. We'd seen how, um, how it was in other states yeah. when marriage became legal and there would be these long lines and people would be waiting all day. I so, hate lines. <laughs> I hate lines. It was a practical matter. We had things to do that day. Um, and so we just tried to get there as soon as possible. So we didn't expect to be the first folks no. that were there. We didn't expect that kind of exposure. Um, we had a moment where we looked at each other and said, do we want to be first? Yeah. And we just kind of looked at each other and said, you know, no, we can, we can, yeah. we can do this. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that, that, I'm glad that we did for a lot of reasons. Yeah, we had no idea that we were the first until quite a while because when we walked in, the clerk was like standing there after you come in and you um, go through the, the metal security. detector. And he was like, hello, are you here to get married? And we're like, this is such great service. <laughs> like, <laughs> what? <laughs> he brought us through, showed us how to do everything, um, showed us where to sign. Um, a reporter walked along yeah, with us. A reporter walked with us and we were meeting with all these reporters and then finally we we're like, wait a minute, are we the first ones? And then they were like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we were the first ones. <laughs> how, did we, how did that happen? Yeah. And then it was just a blur. I mean, it was just a blur. I remember someone saying to me, make sure your makeup looks good to me before you walk out because there's a lot of cameras out there. Mm -hmm. And I was like... It was the security guard. Yeah, the said security that to guard. <laughs> oh, yeah, he said that to you. <laughs> he was like, make sure your makeup looks good. And we were like... I was like, okay. He and knew so, what's up. He told me to tell you. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And so then we walked out and it was like totally wild and crazy and yeah. Come here, bud. You wanna stand? And it was a pretty amazing ride. Um, we, we thought it was going to be just for that day, but it was for days and weeks and months later. Yeah. And there are still moments now where someone will say, oh, I know where I know you. Um, oh yeah, that happens and then a lot. They'll, re they'll remember us or we'll go into a restaurant here and we'll see somebody who recognizes us. Um, I'm a professor at VCU and you know, every semester there's another student that says, I, I realize how I know who you are. And for some of those students, it's really important for them to see that. Yeah. And so it means an awful lot. Um, but the, I just remember the day that I, the day that we were married, we, when we came home and we settled in, Lindsay said, I'm gonna stay up for a little while and I'm just gonna see which media outlets have posted things related to our, our uh, marriage. And um, she, 
she came up late that night and she said, I give up. In, in typical Lindsay fashion, she was making like a spreadsheet with all the places <laughs> that she saw, all the links where she saw us. Yeah. And she said, we're, we're in <laughs> India and Germany and all over the United States and I could spend all of the night checking this out. We'll never know where we are. And to this day, there will be some article about um, gay, you know, LGBTQ community issues, and we'll find another picture of us. Sometimes it's just our hand, and it's just so wild to see, like, we're the only ones that know that's our hand, but the AP shot that photo, yeah. and now we are the hands of the LGBTQ community. I think a really hard thing for my mom when I came out was thinking that we wouldn't be able to have children, um, that I wasn't gonna be able to have children. That was like a really, I remember her just being so sad about that. And I remember one day she was even watching Oprah and she called me, she was like, you can still have a baby. They have this thing, it's called artificial insemination. You can, I was like, yeah, mom, I still have a uterus. Like I know that I can still have a baby. Um, but uh, so she was, she was very happy when Nicole and I got together. And then of course, I mean, Zora is just like, she is the light of, I think every single one of our family members. They're so happy. She's such a loved baby. For sure. Yeah. And I would say that my family, um, I, I didn't have any concern. You know, we're talking about a person who's been out for a couple of decades by the time this has happened. Yeah. Um, and a family that's already accepted us as family. Mm -hmm. So uh, legal marriage in Virginia didn't create the notion that we were a family yeah. to, to anybody who loves us. Yeah. We were already a family at that time. We got one piece of hate mail, mm -hmm. um, and it was like not like even real. Like it wasn't even a concern. It was it was very weirdly worded. From another state. Poor grammar. Something um, that clearly had been sent to other people. Yeah, it, was like, it wasn't a big concern. There are so many people that are dealing with social justice issues um, in the LGBTQ community and other communities that um, we're not just sitting in that space feeling like everything has just gotten great. I think we worry a lot about Zora and how she'll be perceived as having two lesbians um, as her mom. And so far, I think that she, we haven't seen anything like that, but we know that it will happen. Um, and that's part of the reason we do love living in Richmond. Richmond is an awesome city. It's definitely where we wanna raise her. And I think that there are lots of people who are also gay families, um, LGBTQ families who have kids, which is awesome. But I feel like the community as a whole is super supportive to us and our family. And I don't ever feel worried about, you know, us walking together with her at a festival or anything like that. And it's really fun to get to share that with her. Um, and yeah, Richmond is such a great place. It's, it's an awesome place to raise a kid and we're really happy to be here with her. You made a very conscious choice yeah. to, to live in Richmond yeah. and to start our family here.